Welcome to Relational Mission, a way of life. A podcast where we discuss what it means to be a family of churches on mission with God, to be globally fruitful, crossing all boundaries, to reach the nations, to make disciples and plant locally led churches. This is the second series exploring how to be a word and spirit church. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Relational Mission Word and Spirit series and I'm here with Anna Goodman from City Church in Cambridge and also Mike Betts from Lowestoft. If you want the full introductions then listen back to session one and session two. My name's Adam Vogt and I'm from Cornerstone City Church in Medway and we are here to talk about again the importance of the word of God, the Bible, alongside the Holy Spirit. And this is something which we might presume, or many might, that everyone knows they're both important, but not necessarily. Mike, why don't you give us a quick reminder of why we want to focus on these two very important values and truths? Well, yeah. Hello, everybody. Good to be back with you. I think we wanted to do a a podcast series that just explored these two themes, because sometimes it can seem as if in the Christian world, particularly particularly in the West, I wouldn't say it's necessarily true globally, but particularly in the West where, where we are most familiar, um, there can be, in some churches, an emphasis on the Word of God, uh, and rightly so. There are some good exposition, proper hermeneutics, in other words, what the Bible's saying, how you interpret it, how you apply it, really good focus on those sorts of things, doctrine, theology, all that sort of thing, which obviously is amazingly important. Uh, but it can be somewhat, uh, it can become a little bit of a dry exercise. And as much as the Bible is there to, to draw us to Jesus and to reveal his person and his work so that we engage with the relationship with him. Um, and then you've got the other side, which is sometimes in churches sort of the more, focus on the Holy Spirit and his power, his gifts, his manifestations, his manifest presence, seeking his activity, which can sometimes be the focus at the at the expense of wanting to be really well grounded doctrinally and handling scripture well, etc. And so what we're trying to do is just to, to, to put a bit of a flag above the, the parapet and say those two things should belong together that when you have the word of God being rightly handled personally and corporately and where you have the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit um, being displayed in all sorts of ways and works and activity both personally and collectively, then actually the church is more likely to become the mature expression of the body of Christ that he designs her to be. So we're just trying to have a little humble, diligent attempt to flag a few issues and say, look, these two things should be together and they do work together so let's do our best to try and build church with both of these things as key ingredients yeah yeah that's great thanks thanks mike for little summary there so let's let's jump straight in and we're we're gonna go right back to basics here we don't want to take anything for granted so thinking about what what is the bible um let, let's just spend a, a little bit thinking about the history of the bible maybe some of the basics around how it was put together and why why it's important. Um, some people might think of the Bible as being some some good suggestions or maybe some good principles. But when we think about the Bible as being authoritative, having authority and having uh, inerrancy, having an accuracy about its truth claims, that, that's, that's, man, that's giving it... Uh, a huge weight but yet we we know as christians it was put together by men by men men and women that are in the bible these are stories that are there they it didn't just drop from heaven did it so when when we think as christians about the bible we we give it we give it weight but yet it was put together by lots of different people wasn't it 
so how do we know that we can we can give it that kind of authority uh, we can lean on to it in the kinds of ways that christians like us do so any any thoughts or comments on that where where's it come from mike the bible and um why lean on it in this way well i think with anything to do with the christian faith fundamentally it is a faith issue so hebrew says without faith it's impossible to please god because whoever comes to him must believe that he exists and that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. In other words, we must believe that he's there his na- uh, and what he's like, his nature and his character. So we have to take a step of faith. So in some ways with the Bible, the same is true, but it is reasonable faith. We're not asking people to believe in fairy stories or things that have just been cobbled together in sort of silly, silly ways. So it's the 66 books, uh, separate pieces of writing, different kinds of literature from poetry, wisdom, narrative, uh, apocalyptic, which is a certain type of writing, prophecy, uh, you know, different kinds of writing by different authors over many, many years, all of which come together in a cohesive revelation of what God wants to say to us, which is enough to satisfy our faith, but not enough necessarily to satisfy our curiosity, is often the way I try to put it. And that our faith is, is able to land on the writings of scripture being a detailed accurate revelation of what god is like what his work, what he's done who he is and what he's done and our belief and practice can be formed from that as the bible itself says of itself you know all scripture is god breathed yeah and it's useful for teaching you know, correcting training in righteousness. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that those who wrote Scripture knew that they were writing Scripture. So when people, when the gospel writers wrote the Gospels, they were just keeping, they were just doing, you know, doing a journal, basically. And the fact that all those four different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all come together in a, in a, in a remarkable cohesiveness, even though there's different aspects that they all focus on, uh, I think in, in many ways um, heightens the... Um, the authenticity because it wasn't like a collective script let's all put our stories together and make sure they match they, were, they weren't do, doing that yeah and so the same when you look at every different section of scripture it has an authenticity to it, it has a it has a, a, a robust uh, integrity to it that even when you hold it up to scrutiny it, 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 there's a cohesiveness to it so i think there's 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 that side of it it's it's, it's a cohesive written account over many years by different people in different situations concerning the work of God amongst man and who God says he is. Yeah, yeah. Great summary there, Mike. So are, are there errors? So that, that verse you quoted, I think, t- t- 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed mm-hmm. and useful for correcting, rebuking, training in righteousness. So God breathed. So... We're, we're saying that God did absolutely have a hand in the in the writing, but it wasn't like a hand from heaven came, that the, mm. the truth was breathed out by his spirit, by his hand, but he worked through fallible human beings. So could, is there any errors in the Bible? Would we say it's God breathed, but a few things they put in there, they maybe made some mistakes around some numbers or they made mistakes around what god really meant is that possible well well i think it, it it it's it wasn't dictation so it wasn't like people hearing what god wanted to write and then them copying it down as i said somewhat they weren't even particularly aware they were writing scripture um but it's i think that the word to use is god superintended the activities of people's normal functional ability, their education, their style of writing, their their normal faculties. He superintended, he oversaw what was being written so that what we are left with is a completely accurate account of revelation-wise of what God wants to say. Now, there are one or two in the, New, in the Old Testament, particularly there are one or two what we might call transcription errors where um, as copies of manuscripts have been passed down through the years or whatever that a couple of noughts might have got left of how many donkeys somebody owned 
I can think of a few verses like that where in one in one book it says three thousand men or whatever, and in another book it says thirty thousand. It's just someone missed a nought of. Now, does that fundamentally undermine the revelation of the scripture? I think not. It just shows in some ways that a, a simple transcription error doesn't undermine the whole thing. So I think I think it's also learning the difference between revelation and, and illumination. So revelation is what is God disclosing to us? What is the what is what is he saying? And illumination is understanding what he's what he's revealing. So revelation does vary in the Bible. So if you read numbers, for example, it might tell you how many goats a certain man owned. Great stuff. How much is that full? Is that fully fully revelation? Is that complete revelation? Yeah. And illumination. How does that really help us? Well, it teaches us that people had goats. If you look at Isaiah 53 and, you know, he was pierced for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities on him. The punishment that brought us peace was, you know, was was on him, as it were. Is that just as rev much revelation? Yes. Uh, sorry. No, because it's saying um, that Jesus was our sacrifice. So it's the first one was talking about goats. This is talking about how, Jesus, how God saves us. So there's more revelation. Uh, there's more things within it, but its authority is the is the same. It's it's authentic. It's it's not like one is more important than the other. The illumination that's being given in that scripture is greater in Isaiah than it is about the goats. There's just more more within the text, if that makes sense. So there's yeah. there's varying amounts of of uh, illumination and revelation, but it's all it's all it's all uh, God breathed, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's helpful. So so that's that's superintending rather than people going into trances every time and, and mm. sort of you know, auto writing as if they're not in control. Yeah. So very, very, very organic. So it's like God is working in and through in a very personal way. He's not he's not taking over human bodies to do it. And ne neither is he leaving people just to their own, you know, write down what I told you last week. There's something immediate and connected about the way in which God is working with with humans to to put this together. And then yes. what, what about what about when it was. Put together as what what would be known as a, a canon of scripture so because it was written over thousands of years um and then late later in the early centuries people had to make decisions like groups of people councils had to say actually no not that letter no not that account but yes this what these ones will put in are, are we saying that we believe that purpose as well was superintended by god so there are other um letters books that some would say are in the bible for example the apocrypha um has some other books but we don't include that in our bible it doesn't have the same weight so it, got anyone got any comments on on that the process of actually putting it together well i can just make a slight adjustment to what i said before because i used the word that i wanted I, I admitted a word that i want to just clarify so and this helps with this next question so the inspiration of scripture is the same all the way through. So whether it's goats or whether it's Isaiah 53, the inspiration is the same. The revelation will vary in terms of how much is being told about God, just to make that clear. And then the illumination, the application, obviously will be stronger to do with the crucifixion than it will be to do with goats. When it comes to things like you're now saying about the, the canon of scripture, I think the same thing would have been applied as as the people considering all the various texts that were flying around then, all the different manuscripts. They were looking for, does, does all this hang together as clearly inspired in the same way? Does it carry a cohesion of revelation? Does it carry a cohesion of message? And where um, there were sort of, apocryphal writings things that were editions that were just coming in that people were just reading them and comparing them just as you know peter said uh, of some of paul's writings some of his letters contain things that are difficult to understand which many people distort so even then scripture was being you know misused so i think the various councils that met in the first few centuries of the church they weren't they weren't sort of using 
but they weren't trying to apply their own standard to it. They were trying to just read it and say, well, does this line up with this? Does this all hang together? And, and over many years, very diligent attempts uh, at just being able to see the cohesion of scripture and then therefore the canonizing, the, the, the plumb line, the read, the rule, bringing it all together and say, does this match up? Does this match up? And that's how we arrived at the scriptures as they are today. And there is a remarkable um, cohesion that it all has. It, it doesn't disagree with itself. It's it's yeah. beautifully harmonious. And I think that that's that's a comment I'd make there. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I because I think there's there is quite a bit of historical sort of track you can look back on to see which, which scriptures were were already seen as being part of what became the canon it wasn't like you know in the first few hundred years oh you know we've got all these things here what what are we going to do here boys it was much more they they were they were endorsing what historically had gone before so obviously the old the old testament we know yes that was seen as being the the, the word of god but the new testament well, that was written later wasn't it so when 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 it says all scripture is God breathed, is that talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament? So, but there are ways in which you can sort of li link together. There are other passages and history shows that New Testament letters and things were where they started to be given the same kind of authority as Old Testament books of the Bible as well. So it is that I suppose it's it's worth people knowing, you know, if they're watching this and they've not done Bible, lots of Bible history analysis that if you want to go and look, uh, it's there. There's a there's a strong record and it isn't just randomly put together. There's lot there's lots of thought that's gone on into it. Uh, lots of different generations that have passed on the letters and the documents and uh, and given them weight and authority. Anna, it'd be good to good to bring you in at this point. And um, just to sort of hear from you. So we, we've been thinking about the the authority of the Bible, about it being being God breathed. Just wondering if you've got any thoughts on that from your your experience, really, of, of coming to Christ, which we heard a bit about in the first session and um, just being filled with the Holy Spirit. But what about this thing of the Bible? Um, have you always did you always see it as being God breathed in quite that kind of way? It was a holy book or it was put together by um, groups of people. What, what was your kind of experience of encountering the Bible as the breathed word of God? At first I read it, you know, I, I, I started reading it, I think from the age of eight and I did it largely because my parents told me it was a good thing to do and that, you know, this was um, how God could speak to us and teach us about who he, you know, who Jesus was. Um, and so I think I always had respect and reverence for it, but found it very heavy and dry and struggled to always find, you know, we've said how all of it is God breathed and useful. And I thought, you know, so, some of these passages I'd read, I'd be like, how on earth is that supposed to be useful in my life? It, like, <laughs> you know, some parts just seemed a bit out of date. And I don't know, I struggled definitely with some bits to sort of be like, I just, I don't understand why it's really useful for me to, you know, read this bit. Um. So increasingly over the years, uh, I've I've realised that a lot of the time I need to take a step back, that I've got too immersed in the detail and sort of chewing over the detail that I really, I've missed the big picture, the point of um, the passage that I'm reading. And so I found, you know, commentaries and um, Bible Project. I really am a big fan of Bible Project, but that they've just sort of, help me to understand why you know what was the purpose of having that what was the point of the the passage that I'm reading that kind of thing so I think as I've read it repeatedly as well it's like I've had a new fresh you know revelation of you know what what it is I'm reading why it is so weighty why it is so meaningful but you know as we said you know it's so important that we do that with the spirit's help because otherwise it can be sometimes like reading a you know, telephone book at some point. Um, if if there's no, you know, Holy Spirit bringing it alive and explaining it to us. I read a really good quote 
recently. Here we go. It's Andrew Jukes. Is he's written in The Law of Offerings. He says, the scripture is a key to itself. Besides, we have the Holy Spirit to open it up to us. God is his own interpreter. We fail to understand scriptures because we seldom accept his help. This, I feel assured, is the reason why we are so often in ignorance. It is not that the truth sought for is not in the word, but that through lack of communion with him who gave the word, we have not enough of his mind to apprehend his meaning, even when he has fully expressed it. So I find that really helpful because for me, when I uh, was, you know, in the first session, I think we talked about being filled with um, the spirit, our own experiences, that's something that changed. So I went from believing this was the word of God um, in in my head kind of way to when I was filled with the spirit sort of just um just knowing it and experiencing it and it becoming alive in my heart and you know I would read scripture and it would like elements would pop out to me so I think back to your original question of you know um did I always consider it to be sort of the weightiness and the truth of God and uh, the inspired word of God I think um yes I did but it's it's come alive and become weightier and more a part of me in a way um that has grown over the years as I continue to read it but while you know asking the Holy Spirit to sort of help bring it alive to me and help me to understand the bits that I don't understand yeah yeah mm. yeah I think that's maybe the sobering truth is that the Bible can be really hard to understand even though it's god breathed and even though as you as you you've said that god's there to help us with it so have we got any comments on that because the bible can seem intimidating particularly for new new christians w where do you start what on earth does that mean you know it's pe people say things like well i i i only read the new testament um, or I, I don't read Paul, the Apostle Paul because it's complicated and he seems a bit harsh. I certainly don't. I've never read the book of Leviticus and I don't know what relevance that's got today. So how do we how do we get through that that seeming tension where it's like, well, it's the Bible's for everybody and God's there to help you. But yet it's really hard to understand it and apply it. Uh, what, what, where does one start with that? Well, I, I think there are lots of, you know, it's like anything we, we even the scripture talks about us being um, spiritual children needing to, to leave elementary things and grow up in all things unto him sort of thing. So there is a, there is a sense in which you do grow as a Christian and as in, as you know, grow naturally, you also grow spiritually. And so I think to start with what, what might be called the milk of the word, what might be start with the, the main and the plain, as it were. Um, certainly when I became a Christian, just uh, I was very helped by the navigators. Uh, I used to do a lot of uh, using their topical memory verse stuff and some books by um, I think it was Warren and Ruth Myers where it was understanding God's attributes and understanding God's character and I remember going through those very very soon after I was saved and filled with the spirit and I became fascinated with everything that God had promised and everything that was true about him so I just found myself sort of reading verses a little bit in isolation uh, so a little bit topical so you know they'd probably say here's a section on god's goodness and they give a whole list of scriptures and then i would go through those scriptures perhaps even just one a day and some of them would be little verses some would be sections and then i would learn how to what they taught in the book how to meditate on scripture and meditating on scripture is not about emptying your mind so that you just sit there with a blank sort of thing waiting for the holy spirit to do something Meditating on scripture is thinking through very carefully every word, every phrase. What does this say about God? What does it tell me about me? Is there a promise here? Some of the things that are becoming popular now in what's called discovery Bible study, that sort of collective way of meditating on scripture. I think it's really helpful to learn how to do that. What Just read it prayerfully, read it with the spirit, read it with the Holy Spirit sort of helping. And then he'll bring illumination. What I found was the Holy Spirit would illuminate things to me 
that perhaps were relevant for that day or relevant for where I was in my life or relevant for something you wanted to say to me. And I, I just jot it down. I just journal it. I didn't call it journaling then. I just wrote it on a spiral notepad. But then it became it became more flashy and you called it journaling. Um, but it, basically, it was just writing down what you felt God was saying to you. I used to write it on post-it notes and sometimes take them into work and put them in my locker door. I'd stick them on the door. Yeah, you, there you go. And it's got some there. Um, and uh, I would just write down a verse or something that God had said. So I took those sort of basic building blocks of how to hear God through the scriptures, how to understand God from what he re was revealing about himself and what I could rely upon from his promises. So I became fascinated with him was was the, the big draw in it for, for me because it was changing. Then the more I became fascinated with him, what he was like, what he promises, what he says, how he, what he says he feels and thinks and his opinions. Then it changed my worldview. I started to look at the world differently because I said, well, if God says this is true, then actually I've been thinking this and that's not actually in line with what he says. So I'm, I need to adjust. So that's how I started. And I've, to be honest, I'm a very, <clears throat> very simple person. I've carried on like that ever since. Maybe read a few more books about what I would say that we call hermeneutics, which is understanding the different types of writing. Le read some books about how to read each book of the Bible, understand its context, its culture, who it was being written to, which really does help you, even with a book like Leviticus, really does help you say, oh, right, actually, this is not much different from anything else. You've just got to read it knowing who it was written to, why it was written. Why do they talk about goats? I mentioned goats are going to become a feature. <laughs> There's a lot of goats in all of that sort of stuff. And as Anna said, you think, well, what's this got to do with me? I don't even own a goat. <laughs> I don't even like goats, really. I had a very nasty experience with some goats once, put me off forever. But there's, <laughs> there's, things, there's things like that where you think, well, how is that going to help me? But just having a bit of a, doing a little bit of a read about some, some basic things like that helped me longer term. Even some of the Bibles, you know, good Bibles now with little introduction to the let, to the, to that book, can't you, at the, at the top. That could, the ESV is quite good at that. And um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a number of helpful resources there. So we've, we've mentioned commentaries, which are sort of specific overviews of different books. Uh, written by those that are a bit more expert in language and things. Yeah, great example there. It's a heavyweight series. Then there's... Um, What's that series that you just held up for those who are listening rather than just viewing? Gordon Wenham. Oh, yeah. Word, yeah word, word, biblical, biblical commentary. That was a Gordon Wenham one on Genesis, yeah. Um, then Mike had mentioned the Navigators, so you can look them up online. They've got lots of resources around things like... Bible um, memorization, which is something I remember doing when I I came back to God when I after I was backslidden. In fact, they're on my desk here. Um, th and this was I think this was my my dad's original pack. This oh is yeah, a, I've got one of those. Um, like a this is yeah real leather here. <laughs> trying to see whether it trying to see whether it says real goat skin. Oh. <laughs> Well, that's the only yeah. good thing to do with a goat, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. Make no, it into no. a pochette. This is actually, it says real pig skin. I kid you oh. not. Yeah, look at that. Goodness. Nice. And then inside, so there's lots of little cards um, which have different verses on, and they're all categorized in mm. different series, like D11. This is B Christ's Disciple series. And then there's a different verse that will relate to a different aspect and then you can learn who you are in Christ. So that 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 they're useful and still available. Um although I don't think you get the the pigskin um little holder anymore. You probably get a plastic one or something horrible like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, there was so a good you, book there was a good book I read years ago by Campbell McAlpine, uh how to meditate on the scriptures. And and he, okay. he if you can get hold of that, that's a brilliant brilliant yeah. little book. Uh yeah. simple yeah. Yeah, I've come across that one. And then you mentioned another couple of books. I don't know if you mentioned them, but there's one called um, How to Read the Bible for mm. All It's Worth. Yeah, is that, superb. Is that yeah. Gordon, that's Gordon Fee oh, and oh gosh, I can't I remember. Think it's Stuart and Fee or something like that. Yes. yes. Stuart and Fee. Stuart yeah. and Fee, yeah. So that, that's a good one to show you how to read different books, isn't yes, it? It's sort of absolutely. like a 
diff, you have to read different books in a different way. You can't read the, the prophetic literature in the Old Testament the same as you would read a letter from Paul. You mm. have to apply different like lenses, as it were, and you you wouldn't necessarily take things quite so directly from one of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. But anyway, it sort of talks you through some of the things that when you read, I remember reading that book and thinking, oh, yeah, yeah that's true. I never thought of it like that. And that's that's why I keep hitting this same question. Because um, I think one of the things that we can do, maybe we can pause here for a bit, is that that if if someone's reading the Bible and they're reading an Old Testament book, could be a prophet could be the book of deuteronomy and then they flick and they might read the book of ephesians particularly the the last three chapters of ephesians which are all very kind of directive and practical and and we can easily make the mistake of taking commands equally <clears throat> but we need to be careful that we're not taking something that's just said in the Old Testament as applying immediately to us in the same way as a New Testament letter might, um, which is why I think these these books are so helpful. But what, what would you say around that to people who say, well, I'm not really I'm not really a Bible scholar or a theologian, almost as if that lets you off the hook. I leave that up to the church leaders. I just sort of open my Bible and, you know, Oh, this is the bit I'll read today. I just take it directly. Um, any, any comments on that sort of approach to the Bible? Well, I, I, uh, I'm a visual person, and um, so I like analogies that help me to understand these things. But we've mentioned several times about the fact that you know, um, you know, two, two Timothy three sixteen, um, all all Scripture is God breathed. So I think the key word there is all. Um, all of it is necessary for us. Um, so my how I kind of see it is, you know, you're told nowadays by your parents or by your teachers or by your general practitioner, you know, eat, eat, eat your ve veggies, your fruit and veg, eat the rainbow. And the, the idea behind that, I've got analogies here, is that the minerals and vitamins in an orange are different to what you find in a red fruit. Um, uh, this is actually a pepper. But all of the different vegetables and fruit and the different colours contain stuff that are good for your body, good for your health and are vital for sort of you living in the optimal way. Um, it would not be good if I only ate just red peppers. It would not be good if I only ate just spinach or um broccoli the the whole point is you know you need to eat the rainbow you need to eat all of it and so i see scripture a bit like that in that all of it is good for me all of it is necessary all of it should be chewed on and digested and assimilated because um god's given it to me and it's for my own spiritual health so i think you know people who think that it's okay just to eat psalms or don't sort of consistently read the whole bible are basically missing out sort of the, to use the fruit and veg analogy they're missing out on some vitamins that are really good for their health so i would just encourage them i mean i i'm i need a plan so i like using something like you know there's loads of apps out there that are really helpful that sort of take you uh, through the bible in a year but if that's too much you could do bible in two years but it just makes sure that you are um reading all of it because i really do believe all of it is good for you so yeah i mean if we're if we're plugging certain resources, then yeah, U version very good. Um, Bible Project also does videos, yeah, so you've got the the pictures. Yeah. Also, you know what you said, Adam, about sort of setting context. You know, what is the book you're about to read? How should you read it? Bible Project is really good, and that's sort of interwoven with the lots of um, apps that they do to take you through reading it in the year. And I've I've done it about three times using this method um this bible project method and i just found it so helpful for me actually like really you know after all of these years really starting feeling like oh, I, I now i feel like i really actually do understand you know the purpose of all of these books mm. and and loving all of these books i mean who would know that you know you love numbers and leviticus and the way that you would still love you know the gospels or psalms whatever but i do i do love every book because i think that you know all of it is all of it is valuable 
Can yeah. I ask a question, Anna? Just because I know your your background is in neuroscience, so mm. you know, in some ways, you know, how people think, the way the brain functions, and all the connect interconnectivity with the rest of us. And I, I've read information recently. I think you've even sort of tweeted it, or you you put such stuff out there saying that there's some theories saying that the way um, modern life is developing actually does affect the way people learn or receive information or process information or are, are have helped to learn or I don't know apply things in their lives in different ways I'd just be interested in whether you've got any thoughts about the how to help kind of a Christian living today particularly in a very multi-sensory bombarded world how to make sure that even if we are changing to some degree in the way we process information, how to, to use that to our advantage when it comes yeah. to scripture. So that, so that particularly if someone is not, not necessarily an academic type of person or, a, or even someone who particularly, I don't know, enjoys reading because yeah. scripture isn't, or the Bible, uh, sorry, Christianity isn't about books, is it? It's about relationship, yeah. but we have the book to help the relationship. So I just been just many thoughts you've got on that hmm good question yeah I mean I think what they're saying now is that your your so you've got your left side of the brain which is more analytical right side I mean this is a real oversimplification mm. of it all but the right side is more artistic um, and they're saying with the sort of advent of social media um, which is largely visual that actually our brains are being wired in such a way that there's slightly more of an emphasis towards your right side. So um, the idea behind that, you know, your creative artistic side, um, that if we want to reach out and communicate to people nowadays, that actually we should bear that in mind. Um, and so, I mean, that would, that would include things like poetry and visual illustrations, um, mm -hmm. movies, YouTube, um, listening as well. I mean, there's... Um, I think we mentioned before that David Suchet does, you know, mm. reads the whole Bible. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I mean, we're all still different. I'm, I am a visual person, definitely. So I like to have, if I see, you know, you can get Bibles that are really illustrated in a beautiful way. Um, and again, Bible Project does all of these illustrated, illustrated versions of um, the books. So I would say um, just engage all of your senses um, because actually one of the best ways of learning is by using all of your senses and engaging your whole body. So reading, reading the words, speaking the words out loud, um, that's another thing that helps you to sort of remember what you're reading mm -hmm. um, once you've spoken it. Um, hearing it as well, listening to what other people, um, what other people are saying or also hearing your own words. Um, and, you know, drawing illustrations to help you to, to illustrate. You, you can get wonderful journaling Bibles um, with wide margins where you can actually um, draw and illustrate what you're uh, reading. So I think it's part of it is knowing yourself um, and knowing how you learn best, knowing how you engage with things in a way that um, excites you and stimulates you. Um, you know, there are even colouring in books or Bibles, <laughs> if you're into that, colouring in your Bible verses that you want to memorise. Uh, I would just say be be creative in uh, the way that you go about reading scripture, because it doesn't have to be, um, you know, really, really dry. I'm, I love the inductive, I think I mentioned this before, the inductive study Bible. So this is just, I don't know if you can see this properly. Just describe it for the, those who are listening. But, yeah, it's basically um, you read through the Bible, but you're looking for keywords um, that stand out or are repeated key phrases. And you use symbols and colours to highlight those words. And you use symbols to sort of um, highlight um, locations and contrasting words and things like that. And it just gets you to engage with your Bible in um, like a very physical way. So I'm using colors um, and I'm drawing in my Bible. Some people hate to draw on their Bible. I am not one of those people. I have lots of Bibles and I, I can't not engage with it. I can't not draw in it. But for me, using colors 
um, now I can easily flick through the Bible and because of the symbols and colours, I can be like, okay, that was a theme of that book, that was a theme of this book, just by seeing things pop out um, like that. I, I would also say, you know, I I went through a phase when I had two really young children and I was really um, sleep deprived, but I just felt like I struggled really hard to read my Bible because I'd had like two hours sleep every night and I'd... Um, my brain was just so foggy and what really saved me there was reading children's bible to my kids so i would say you know if you if if people are starting out if they're not so fluent in um english language or their, their own languages but they can get hold of a um a child's bible like a good jesus storybook bible for example um that is a really i mean we want to grow into maturity we want to read you know, actual actual scripture eventually. But I think that's not a bad place at points in your time to, you know, if you're really intimidated by the Bible, read a children's Bible, get the whole big picture in a different way because it's it's communicating in a language that is supposed to be easy to understand. And then you can go and go into more detail um in 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 that kind of way, you know, to, mm. to really grasp and get that maturity, solid food reading of the Bible. Um, hmm. I also have another analogy, if you like my analogies. I, I'm up for my yeah, props today. Um, but you, you mentioned meditating, and I think one of the things that they're saying people nowadays, especially sort of the younger generations that are coming up, is because of the overstimulation, they're really struggling to focus and to hone in their, um, their mind on one particular thing because it's like, you know, they've got all of these tabs going on in their head and they can't focus they can't meditate um and i would like to use the illustration of you can't this is linseed or flax seed depending on where you're from and it's it's an amazing it's an amazing seed it's really good so full of fiber you know omega-3 um fatty acids it's really really good for you um but you need to chew on it really really well otherwise it just passes straight through you and um i just think that that's for me, that's a really good analogy of like you really need to discipline yourself sometimes to meditate, or even if it's difficult, to meditate on scripture and to really chew on God's word. Because otherwise you can miss, as you've already said, Mike, so much of the goodness of um of scripture because you're just reading it too fast. So I'm not saying that it's not good to read sort of big chunks quickly. Um, but I think it is really good to um, meditate um, on on scripture and make sure you're not missing out on you know key key words. I mean, the the you also mentioned um, sort of with my background of neuroscience. Um, another thing that I think is reason why I think it's really good to meditate on God's words is because um, have you ever heard the expression neurons that fire together wire together? It's um, in, no. in science. <laughs> Maybe it. that's just the world that I'm living in. But basically, your your brain is, um, they use the word plastic. It's obviously not plastic, but it it's malleable. A lot. <laughs> it, it, it's not this rigid structure that, it, like, once you hit a certain age, that's it. That's your brain. It's it's like concrete. You know, you're that's that's how you're formed and you're going to think it's constantly um being rewired and it's constantly changing and you know you when you meditate you're having a certain thought pattern so if i'm reading meditating on scripture i'm i'm thinking about the words of god and thoughts are made up of sort of different neurons wiring together firing and setting um each other off and the more you have a certain thought the stronger that connection um takes place um, and 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 shapes the way that your brain is wired and the when the opposite is true so when you don't have certain thoughts connections become weaker so i love that because that sort of backs up what scripture says you know be be um renew be transformed by the renewing of your mind take captive every thought and make it obedient to christ you can have the mind of christ we're told and um, we do have the mind of christ and we do that by meditating on scripture because as we have god's thoughts and we meditate 
um, on his word, his inspired word, we're actually neurologically shaping the way that our, you know, nerves in our brain are, are firing and um, are patterned together. So I, I love that. So that's why I, I love the navigators memorizing verses, because you're actually, as you're doing that and having these repeated thoughts over and over again, you are wiring your brain and you are having the mind of Christ by reading the inspired word of God. I'll stop that's talking brilliant. now, sorry. That's, that's brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's helpful, I think, just to be reminded, again, the way God knows how we're made, he made us, and so he's not, he's not working in a way which is sort of separate from our natural processes he's working in the in the midst of of brains uh, as well as hearts and the, the sort mm. of hidden parts of us by the spirit um because i think sometimes we can m maybe over super spiritualize it you know like it's this sort of magic book and you read it and you wait for this revelation or illumination to hit you when actually god's wanting to work through our brains and through thinking and planning and writing things down and remembering so it's very uh, integrated which was one of the things i was thinking about because you could you could read or study the bible um as theology theology is is about the study of god um it could be just academic but it's supposed to be practical as well isn't it the theology and we're, we're told that in in the new testament for example in in the book of james where it says it's those that that are reading and studying that do it that actually are, are blessed and that start to understand the fullness of the word so have we got any comments on that about how to avoid it being either just academic in the sense of it's something we study but it's not really being applied because unless you apply it and do it it doesn't seem to take on its life and its force. Mm. Or alternatively, I think just about reading every bit of the Bible through like a me-centered lens, you know, it's always about me. And when I open the Bible, it's God speaking to me and it's God directing me every day, which, yes, it is. But we know it's not just that. There's a far bigger foundation than sort of reading it in quite that personalized me centered way actually the bible's about god it's about jesus actually and how you find your place in the light of that so any comments on that mike we'll, we'll go to you first so me centered and also making sure it's it's practical and applied not just academic yeah well i think the the academic side of it is it you know there are some things that it's good for us to learn so that we can then read it with correctness as it were so that we're, we're not decrying academic you know uh, excellence in these things but not everybody is academically you know wired strongly and 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 you don't have to be an academic to to progress well in the christian life in actual fact corinthians says not many of you were wise or you know in terms of greek kind of you know sort of way of viewing that sort of thing so i, I don't think it's an academic exercise it it's about reading the Bible with the Holy Spirit. Um, and I think Luther talks about letting, he says, when I'm reading scripture, sometimes I let my thoughts go for a walk with the Holy Spirit. I think that's a, that's a lovely uh, turn of phrase, using an image like unless you're going with a friend uh, on, a, on, a, on a walk that, um, that you didn't intend to go on, but you're going on that walk and, deepening the friendship, deepening the relationship as you go on that walk. And I, I think uh, I, I've, I've developed a posture personally over the years where I, I expect the Holy Spirit to speak to me from Scripture. And invariably, almost every time I pick up the Bible, I would say something is illuminated to me that really does me good. Uh, it's, and I think that is how we should read, expecting God to speak to us. And it, it may not feel like, you know, God dictating something that we hear in audible voice. It, I don't think that's hardly ever the case. But something will will erupt within us that we think, well, that that isn't my that thought didn't come from me. That is a that is a, a an invasion of my thoughts to which I am in full agreement and, uh, you know, to which I am attracted. But it didn't originate with me. It didn't originate in my conscious looking for something, and it certainly didn't originate even in my subconscious because I wasn't, you know, there's no, sometimes I've had thoughts from scripture that I know are 
not something I would have generated from within myself um, because of things that are stored away in the past or whatever. It, it, it really is a case of God invading with some with some fresh fresh illumination. So I, I I'm reading the Bible always to hear God. I want to hear God. I want my relationship with Jesus to be strengthened. That's what I'm looking for. Wanting to hear his voice. And the thought about, you know, is it all about me? Well, I think the thing is that when, when we read the scripture and see the bigger purposes of God, it, it should make us feel smaller, but it should also make us feel in some ways more important because when we see that we have a part to play in the most massive family that has ever been on planet Earth, and we're connected with brothers, sisters, spiritual fathers and mothers, and one generation you know, stands on the shoulders of the previous one in order to keep fulfilling the, the, family, the family business, as it were, it actually makes you feel I'm significant. I'm not an orphan. I'm, I'm, I'm part of... I'm part of God's family. I matter. I've got a place in in God's purposes. Whereas I think we can think, oh, if it's about me, it's about making my life feel significant. Well, you can never feel significant if it's just about you because we're mathematically insignificant. (laughs) We're a puff of smoke that disappears after a few seconds and no one ever remembers us. But if you're part of something bigger that is never going to die away and will become the most significant thing in the universe, it actually thinks, wow, I was invited into that family. I'm part of the biggest deal on the planet. That's that's a much better way of viewing it. So you read it more collectively, you read it more corporately, and actually recognize that most of the New Testament epistles are written to collective groups of people not to individuals there's some that are into individuals but not not the majority it's mostly written to we or you you know being a collective yeah. so it's just yeah. my thoughts adam yeah. what have you what you got anything to add into that i think the thing of reading it me centered is something that it's difficult to move from that to seeing a broader picture you know when i first started to read the bible you automatically are, you're looking for God to speak to you all the time, which I think is really important. And it's it wasn't and an, you know maybe for a few years later I suddenly understood that the, these are letters written to a church, and so if it's saying you, it's you plural. It's the church, um, and I'm I'm in danger here of of focusing on myself in a way which is not actually very healthy. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of slightly squiff what God wants to show the the sort of vision of how things really are by seeing it as, as God just unfolding his own plan for my little life. And I think particularly in the West and our sorts of culture, we we are very self-centered and we're focused on what, what does God want for me? What's, what's my calling? What's my ministry? Um, What's my life? How's that going to turn out? Whereas I think in other parts of the world, they don't think like that. They're much better at thinking, in terms of a, a sort of family or tribes or or their whole community and so i think we do have to be aware it's part it's part of the the way in which we read and grapple with scripture mm-hmm. is to reflect on what what are our biases because we all bring stuff to the reading of books you know in the bible <clears throat> um and we we won't we won't always be aware of it you you read yourself into it often before you're hearing what the, the truth is and so everything is sort of seen through the way our our current world view is um and we just have to be aware of it you can't always correct that but i think that's why having other books and commentaries talking to other people do, doing bible reading in community with others so it isn't just a a, a a book you're reading on your own as part of your own quiet time or devotional time it's supposed to be done together we have to learn from others we have to learn from history church history we have to we have to allow the authority of the bible that we've touched on to to shape us to mold us so that we're not reading into it so it does require humility because you can you can read something or, or have a certain view for 20 years and then suddenly you think actually i'm not sure that was true you know i've i've completely misunderstood something i haven't seen the full orb of it 
and praise God that he's so gracious and patient that he's not always, you know, wagging the finger when we misconstrue something. So I think reading the Bible is a humbling experience um, and, it, and it does shape you and mould you. And as Anna said, you know, literally it's, it's like it's rewiring our brain. So that's something that I've certainly been aware of in, in my own life. What, what about the times marching on? We've got a few more minutes. But what, what about the understanding of the Bible when it comes to different translations? So we, we've, we've touched on the hard work of reading the Bible. We've touched on recognising it's God-breathed and that God's stewarding the putting together of the Bible. But nonetheless, even with that, there's lots of different Bibles people can buy online or in shops, lots of different translations. Some people won't know where to start because there's so many different designs as well. Um, are they all saying the same thing? Does it really matter? Some of them are trying to put it in modern day language. Um, other people say you should read really traditional versions like the King James version because it's more accurate and so on so is there a bible that we should all read and surely if we really want to be accurate we should be learning greek and hebrew and aramaic and read it direct from the source shouldn't we so how do we know and does it matter what kind of bible i'm reading hmm. well i think that, that there's and often a picture is used of a, like a pendulum of different uh, sort of there's a sort of pendulum on what up one end of the scale which is sort of the really word for word translation which might come over slightly clunky or wooden in, in a sort of transferring it from sort of um, Aramaic say into English or Hebrew into English or whatever it might come over not the words don't flow so easily but I think to have in in your possession a fundamentally a, a, a version that's to that end of the Spectrum is, is good. So, I mean, I use the ESV, English Standard Version. I mean, New American Standard Version is good, NIV. Those sorts of basically word-for-word -word kind of attempts to translate. I also think, it, personally, I, I favor an eclectic approach to translation. So where scholars have brought all the manuscripts together to look at the most common word that's used because sometimes different words are used in different manuscripts which can mean more or less the same thing and but might have slightly different nuance because we don't have just one copy that is the bible handed down through the years we have thousands and thousands of parts of manuscripts so we have to and they've all been transcribed so we have to make sure i think an eclectic approach is best Whereas those who argue for a King James approach and the, 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 what's called the textus receptus, you know, the one that the, the, the translation the, or the manuscript that they think, now that's, that's the real one that really has got the most weight to it. So we only use that one. I think that can be a little narrow and I don't think it affects the accuracy of scripture to bring all the different texts together to look at the most common and the most um, uh, frequently used word that different manuscripts have used uh, on, on certain certain translation issues, so I'd always have one that, that that end of the of the of the, the the spectrum. I think if you go to the more looser end, things like the New Living Translation, I think is really good. It's a it's a slightly more uh, flowing English. Um, uh, translation it's still towards the word for word but it's a slightly more thought for thought kind of translation and if you really push it up to the other you've got things like the message which don't claim to be a translation they claim to be a an idiom a thought for thought sort of paraphrase or a comparison and i think i personally find those quite helpful sometimes just to get the the feel of a passage rather but always telling myself that's not a an accurate translation that's a paraphrasing in my language of the general thoughts that are being communicated by the detailed world word for word analysis um, so do we lose do we lose divine inspiration the further down the scale we've gone so if, if it's in the original language and it was literally done word for word it would it would not read very well would it because tr translating a hebrew word into an english mm. word and the, the sentence structure would be all wrong so we're saying that yeah if, if you can if you can read an original language and you get into that world then you're it, it's it's almost like it's a kind of a not not more pure but 
you've got to re read in the original language if you can, but for the 99% of people, that's not the case. So it's mm. okay to use a translation, but they do get diluted. Well, they get they language is a is a is a a moving thing anyway, isn't it? It's uh, is words mean different things at different times. So sometimes the the translation issues that scholars, Bible translators wrestle with are not so much well, what does this mean? It's like what did that mean? What did that word mean when it was written? Because words change in their use, and so often it's not oh, is this contradictory? It's just how do we really get to what was the the question to ask ourselves is the person who wrote it it can't mean now what it didn't mean then so whoever wrote wrote it originally had thoughts in their mind they were trying to communicate and translation is about unpacking accurately those thoughts so that we're not imposing what we wish he'd said but we're actually saying no this is actually what was said and the words he chose in the context he was in, in the culture he was in, to the audience he was writing in, are best translated today by saying that word means this. And that's the, that's the art, I suppose, of translation. Um, there's controversy, as, uh, as we would know, about things like the Passion Translation. And we've done, as a relational mission, we've done a video about that because we have concerns that that's because it's calling itself a translation when i don't think it passes the tests of being a translation i think that is a that is a concern so uh, whereas things like the message which don't claim to be a translation they claim to be a thought for thought you know um paraphrasing uh that you know that's what you're reading so i think we have to be distinguish carefully the difference between a translation and a and a paraphrase so so that we 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 attribute slightly different weight well considerably different weight to those two things yeah 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 that's helpful so again it it, it underlines the fact that we have to work hard to understand yes. the bible you can't you can't just get a bible off a shelf and presume everything's in place you know this is a this is a helpful translation we need we need to do our background work mm. To truly, to truly understand God, to study God is to study his words and to try to grasp what, what the original words might have meant. And we can use different um, translations or not translations to help warm our heart and give us an insight. But we have to be careful about giving everything the same sort of weight and authority. Is that what we're saying? We're saying, yeah, the, 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 the word of God in its purest form, we say, has got authority, but not necessarily every so-called translation in the way it's put down. That that could have some extra bits that are added in to give it a certain spin. It might be helpful, but don't just take everything at face value in the way that you read it. So do, do a bit of research into how bibles are put together and because it's a lot of bibles are put together by groups of people which is good because they pay attention to the history of translation it isn't just one person so that should give us some yeah. some security it's more more is an honest job of trying to make 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 the most of what's gone before and like peer-to-peer -peer accountability hmm. yes i mean i you know just speaking very practically personally uh, i would say an esv and an NLT, like a New Living Translation, those two, if you wanted to, if, if you're starting out reading the Bible, then then those two do give you, I think, safe parameters w within the things that we're talking about. That that um, one is one is a word kind of trying to get for word for word, thought for thought, meaning for meaning, sort of you know phrase for phrase. The other is 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 a bit more of a. Um, uh, makes makes the 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 makes it flow easier in, in the english language but we just have to recognize some of the words are not necessarily exactly um the words that were used in the original but still equivalent to be able to get the same meaning from it i think yes. the thing of being the, the scripture all scripture is inspired but some has as we said earlier some has more revelation some bits have more revelation than other bits and it's it's being really careful with uh, the, 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 with with that we get the right thing out of it that God intended from it. That's the thing that's we've got to sort of safeguard that, yeah. and um, be be careful with. There's and there's such a multiplicity of translations now as well, isn't there? 
and different words mean different things yeah. in different languages as well, different cultures. So even that is a, I found that out, you know, the hard way when I started sort of preaching and teaching on different things in different cultures with different languages, that words I was using, well, that just, that doesn't translate into that language, let alone from the scripture. So it's, it, it, we had to do quite a lot of work. So for example, even the word elder, I remember talking about leadership teams and eldership, whereas the culture I was in at the time, elder meant an old man. It just was, it was just, so they didn't even understand that word. So I oh, think, right, okay, what do, what, what does the Greek words actually say? And then you sort of interpret it more into a culture that would, you know, find that more accessible than old people. Well, we've covered a lot of ground and mm. um, it, well, I think we could do a sort of separate series just on this, really. My brain's thinking all kinds of things we could go off into. So maybe just in closing, we, we could all give our own personal encouragement to those listening in terms of reading the Bible. Um, if people are thinking, where, where do I start? Or I've grown a bit weary. Um, I've been a Christian a while. Uh, I've grown a bit weary. What 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 might we want to advise as a bit of an idea or inspiration over the next sort of few weeks what 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 would you say is important to do an idea or something that you've been using in the in the past few months or years so inspire us Anna any thoughts well what's really I've loved one of my favorite things this year has been um again it's the reading the Bible in a year with someone else. So you version, you get to go and at the end of all of the stuff that you've read, you comment, you know, what is the one thing that stood out to you? What is the one thing you feel God has spoken to you about? And um, I've been doing that with other people. I think we're on a day 118 or something like that at the moment. Um, but I've loved that because, you know, as you've already mentioned, Adam, it's it's really good to read the Bible in community. And the fact that I'm doing this plan with other people keeps me going, keeps me encouraging to stick on track. Um, but I've loved the fact that we would read exactly the same passages and what stands out to one person is completely different to what stands out to the other person, because that is, you know, the Holy Spirit Um bringing it alive and highlighting, you know, different things to different people. Um, yeah. I would, yeah. I mean, the other thing I would just sort of, since this is the Word and Spirit series, I would just encourage people if they, you know, to to really invite the Holy Spirit to be with them as they read the Bible, because I really, really think that that is, is so key. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, but can I just read one quote that I find really, really helpful? It's it's David Duplessis. Have you heard of him? It's mm -hmm. written Duplessis, but I think you pronounce it Duplessis. And he was asked by all of these teachers who were, were not charismatic of different um, leaders of different churches, you know, why is it that you've seen so much growth? And so that he was invited to speak to them. And this is one question they asked him. They said, please tell us what is the difference between you and us? We quote the, the same scriptures as you do. And yet when you say those words, they sound so different. We say the same things that you do, but there seems to be a deeper implication in what you say. You have said nothing with which we want to differ. And yet there seems to be a distinct difference somehow. What was I to say? What was the truth? The spirit came to my rescue and I said, Gentlemen, comparisons are odious, and I do not wish to injure anyone's feelings or hurt pride. But the truth, as I see it, is this. You have the truth on ice, and I have it on fire. And for me, that, again, is like the difference between reading scripture with and without the spirit is, you know, having the truth, God's truth, but it being on ice. You know, he uses the illustration of a steak. You can't eat an a, a, fr a frozen steak but you can when it's been on fire and all the juices mm. come out and so for me I would just encourage people invite the Holy Spirit every time you read it and expect um, God to speak to you because you know the Spirit brings it alive and on fire. Mm. Yeah that's great lovely stuff thanks Anna. Mm. Mike? Brilliant that was brilliant yeah I love the idea of reading collectively as well that can really help some people who find sort of sitting down on their own reading difficult i think that's a brilliant idea very quick for me i mean i i, I as i say i'm a very sort of simple way of doing things i like to give myself a nice 
Moleskin, other brands are available, but I like a nice Moleskin journal and a nice good ESV Bible, and I just work my way through sometimes very, very small portions of Scripture. It can be just a verse. So at the moment, I'm just reading the Ten Commandments. I'm just doing one a day, you know, uh, and up until then, I was reading a chapter a day of the rest of Exodus, and then I got to that, and I just felt the Holy Spirit say, just go through these one at a time and think about them. And, uh, yeah, just, again, God, I felt God speak to me, illuminate that to me. So, And then I'll just write down what I get out of it, what I think God's saying to me, that sort of thing. I'll just make sure I write something every day, just externally process what I think God said. It doesn't have to be right. It's just what I'm feeling. And uh, then I'll think about it, pray about it, and perhaps carry it with me through the day. Sometimes think, is there something God wants me to do with this information in other different contexts I'm in? Is it prophetic? Is it just personal? So very, very simple. Pen, journal, moleskin, and ESV Bible. Away you go. Super stuff. It's great. Thanks, Mike. I should be sponsored by moleskin. This, this podcast <laughs> should be sponsored by That'd moleskin. That'd be nice, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, if if you're listening, moleskin, moleskin people, yeah, give us give us a deal. Get in contact with us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, something that I started doing a, a few months back again, I did it before in the past, was to try to read through the Psalms and do a Psalm each day, in addition to the sort of regular bits of scripture as you guys have outlined, sort of reading through with a book and pen. So that that's my sort of style as well. Um, to try and jot down, yeah, what, what what does this mean? What God's saying? What does it mean then? Uh, what's the bigger picture and context? I'm always thinking that through. What's what's the story underneath the story? What's this revealing about the character of God, um, and so on? But re reading through the Psalms, so I've been doing that, and I'm just back starting again now. I'm on Psalm Psalm two today. And again, just reading them through at some pace to get through them sometimes, but just to constantly have that worship uh, mindset in place. It was something I think I heard from Tim Keller, who's an American pastor, theologian, that, that that's something he, he's been doing for years and years and years. And I thought, yeah, that, that's good because the, the Psalms are a, a worship book, they're, they're poetry and worship. And so good to take them and turn them into to prayers so that's something i'd i'd recommend as well brilliant cool Great. all right well we should bring it into land then it's been yeah. good chatting with you mike and anna and um until next time we will say our goodbyes so thanks yeah. for all your comments thanks viewers for watching and listeners if you're on podcast do get in contact with us as well, if you've got any questions or, or comments, then there is an email. I haven't got it to hand to flash up, but I think it was uh, RM at podcast or something like that. We'll make sure it's on the links. <laughs> we'll make sure it's on the links yeah. when this is actually published. We'll make sure it's down below on the link. So get in contact with us. So thank you all. Until thank next you. time, farewell. Right. Yeah, see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Do get in touch and connect with us via Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at RM Churches. For more information, you can also go to the website www.relationalmission.org.